Welcome to the Rate Connection at Thorough Farm. The Rate Connection is an exciting new program of lectures and writing workshops. For now, we'll be meeting over Zoom. After the COVID crisis, most of our programs will meet in the house where Henry was born. Whether you're a writer ready to submit your manuscript for publishing, looking, looking to strengthen your voice, or searching for a community of writers, you'll find it at the Rate Connection. My name is Michael Frederick. I'm the Executive Director of the Thoreau Society and will be moderating today. Today we have with us a special guest, Eric Weiner, who's written the book, The Socrates Express, In Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers. You can purchase the book at the shop at Walden Pond and to save 15%, you can enter the code capital HDT 1817 at checkout. Eric is author of New York Times bestsellers, The Geography of Bliss, The Geography of Genius, as well as the critically acclaimed Man Seeks God, a former, a former foreign, foreign correspondent for NPR. He has reported for more than three dozen countries. His work has appeared in The New Republic, The Atlantic, the National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, and the anthology Best American Travel Writing. He lives in the Washington, D.C. area with his wife, daughter. For more information, visit ericweinerbooks.com or follow him on Twitter at eric underscore weiner. Today, we have a provocative title for our audience. Was Henry pond scum or seer? In his book on Socrates Express, Eric writes the following. A few weeks before my journey to Concord, I stumbled upon a New Yorker article about Thoreau. It was called pond scum. And as you can imagine, did little to rehabilitate the hermit of Concord in my mind. The story's author, Catherine Schultz, opens the piece by painting a picture of the cold-hearted, misanthropic crank. Then she takes the gloves off. But as the commuter train pulls into Concord Station, Eric writes, just as it did during Thoreau's day, I resolve to maintain an open mind. So welcome, Eric. Thank you, Mike. Happy to be here. Um, so would you like to, uh, <laughs> weigh in on, on the, yeah, like we're, we're, I, li I, I like the way we're starting with the big questions right out of the, right out of the gate. I like that. Um, the Henry Thoreau, uh, pond scum or seeker or seer, uh, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, he's all these things, uh, pond scum, seeker and seer. Um, you know, when I, when I read the article, um, I, I thought, you know, oh no, I, you know, I, I was determined to include Thoreau in my chat, my book of 14 philosophers and their approach to sort of better, more meaningful lives. And here he is being taken down a few notches by no less of a prestigious publication than the New Yorker. Um, but after reading it, I thought, well, okay, that's one side of Henry David Thoreau and it's probably accurate, nothing really untrue in there except it's just looking at him from the worst possible vantage point. And what I've tried to do with all my philosophers that I encounter in, on, on the Socrates Express is to take a generous, at, at generous attitude toward them and to view them in the most positive light, even though they were all imperfect and Thoreau, no exception. I mean, the, in the research I, I did, I quickly discovered that he was a difficult man. Uh, Henry James Sr., father of uh, William and Henry James Jr. Uh, called him the most difficult man he'd ever met, the most unpleasant human being. Um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne said he had a certain iron poker pokerishness to him. Mm. I think he was an introvert, and I think he was a, a bit of a crank, um, but I don't think he was pond scum. Um, not really at all, actually. Mm. You um, it did come away in the book with an appreciation for the many, many skills that Thoreau had, his overall skills. Right. 
I mean, look, let, let's face it. I, I approached, uh, I encountered Thoreau maybe differently from the way you did or uh, some of the people participating today. You know, I, I knew him from my ninth grade, you know, as the author of Walden and as kind of a cartoonish figure, you know, a caricature, just off in the woods by himself doing this experiment. And he didn't really have any skills that I knew of other than putting sentences together. But I discovered um, he could skate, um, he could survey, he was a surveyor. He was, as I like to say, the original member of the gig economy. Um, he held down, he was a teacher briefly. Um, he was, of course, in the pencil business and invented a, a device to make pencils better. Um, and in his short 44 years, he managed to do all that and write Walden and write on the Concord and Maranek rivers and somehow bang out 2 million words worth of journal, uh, journal writing. Um, and, uh, he was much more of a Renaissance man than I thought going into this. Mm. That's really, um, it's amazing that, that um, too, coming to Concord and discovering Thoreau, um, that you were able to quickly discover what a multifaceted um, human being he, he was in terms of his interests that extended to each of those points that you just right. made. I mean, we, we're very funny about our icons in America. They're either saints or sinners, you know? They're either great or they're terrible and they're being canceled. Um, the truth is most people, and certainly including Thoreau, are somewhere in between. They are imperfect beings. Thoreau was, was an imperfect being. I think, I think you would agree with that. Um, but he was a more heroic figure and a more creative figure than pretty much anyone else I've encountered. Um, and, you know, it, it's a cliche to say we don't make them like that anymore, but somehow we don't make them like that anymore. To have someone who had, as I, as I write in the book, um, you know, the eye of a scientist and, and the heart of a, of a poet to sort of, you know, he was a great naturalist um, and had a, a poet's take on the world too. And, and these days, because of specialization, you really have to choose, you know, one or the other, which, are you on the STEM track in school or are you on the communications track? You sort of have to decide which silo you're going to fit into at a young age. And one of the benefits Thoreau had was living when he did, when you could still be a little bit of everything, much more than today, I think. Yeah, before the specialization really gets underway. Mm -hmm. When when you came to Concord, I was really um, impressed by you come in on the commu on the commuter line from from Boston, and before that you were traveling by Amtrak, I guess, right. and um, you then start to meet with various Concordians. You met with Leslie Wilson over at the Concord Free Public Library. Thoreauvians, right? Thoreauvians who and and right who work in Concord or Lincoln. Right, right. So uh, Leslie Wilson, Jeffrey Kramer, uh, you came here to Thoreau Farm and met with me. Right. Um, how did you develop um, sort of your plan? You're a journalist. So how did you develop your plan right. on who to see? So I, I do quick, deep dives into subjects. Um, I just throw myself into it. So each chapter, I research it like it's a book. Um, and so I had read a lot before I got up there. And then I followed what a friend of mine calls the golden thread, which is you make a call to one person, say it's Mike Frederick at the Throw Society, Throw Farms, and, and say, you know, I'm researching this book, and I've got a chapter on Throw. who should I talk to? And if... Uh, if you convey a sincerity, because you are sincere in your interest in the subject, and an open mind, in my experience, people can be very generous. The more obscure the subject you're researching, the more generous they are. Um, but before you know it, Mike Frederick is saying, talk to Leslie Wilson, who's saying, you know, uh, talk to Jeff Kramer, who's saying, talk to the other half a dozen Thoreauvians I met with. And, um, you know, it's, it's a community still. It's a, and it, it, I was actually, I was, and I don't mean this just to compliment you, but I was impressed with how this clutch of Thoreauvians all landed on Thoreau, like from different angles. Um, he came to you later in life. You told me about your experience in college. Jeff Kramer was at the Boston Public Libraries for a long time. No one does this for anything else other than love of Thoreau and his ideas. Um, 
there's not a lot of money in Thoreau these days. Um, but I, I was impressed with the the enthusiasm. It wasn't that there were Thoreau scholars in Concord. You could find scholars of Kant and all kinds of philosophers, but real enthusiasm for the man. And that's what I thought that I was onto something. There, there was more to him than I knew. Yeah. And it sounds like you met a very open community in terms of their willingness to um, share their ideas with you. So I wonder if um, how, how Thoreauvians differ from Thoreau the man. If there's... Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll first of all, start by saying how they're similar. Um, they, they have this sort of, this feral nature to them. Um, your beard's looking pretty feral there too, Mike. I don't remember quite that beard when I met you. Um, so there is a feral nature, meaning that um, most Thoreauvians are not attached to a university. Some are certainly, but there's, you know, Thoreau was not. Um, he, was, he was a feral philosopher on his own, reading on his own. So this self-taught nature seems to be something that modern day Thoreauvians have in common with uh, Henry David, or David Henry as he was born, as I discovered. Mm. Um, and so uh, that feral nature, that enthusiasm, that, that really insatiable curiosity about the world, not just about the natural world, about the world, period. Were they different? Thoreau went further. He just went further with his experiments, with his ideas. Um, and I think that's partly, again, we're hemmed in by our times. Um, you know, if you were to try to conduct a modern day Walden experiment in quotes, um, I don't know where you'd go. I don't know how that would be uh, received. Um, I, think it's, I think it's harder to be Thoreau today than it was in Thoreau's time. But I was kind of gobsmacked when I saw a quote from him and it's pretty well known, I'll paraphrase here, about, you know, everywhere there are professors of philosophy, but no philosophers. And he's saying this is 150 plus years ago. Um, and um, yeah, I thought that was a modern development. But even in his day, something as exciting as philosophy had been relegated to the academy. I like that notion of um, self-taught. And we certainly see that um, within, the, yeah. within our membership. So many... Mm -hmm. Uh, so many of us, I think, are lifelong learners. Right, and he and he certainly was. His life was too short, but he, I, if he had lived to seventy or eighty, I think you know, like Emerson, he would have he would have kept learning. I have no doubt. Yeah, and like um, Schopenhauer that you mentioned in your book, Thoreau mm -hmm. also played the flute. So, I don't know if I knew that. Okay, I, I should have known that. Um, and they both played the flute and they had something else in common, which is they were both early uh, adopters, adapters of uh, Eastern philosophy. Um, Schopenhauer, a little bit later than uh, Thoreau, is uh, reading the Upanishads in an early translation, one of the earliest, he had a statue of the Buddha in his living room. And Thoreau, of course, is reading the Bhagavad Gita and um, some Chinese philosophy as well. Um, and back then it was, it wasn't like you walked into and headed to the Eastern religion and new age section of your bookstore. Um, you had to really seek this out and it was not, it was not commonplace as it is today, Eastern thought and Eastern religions. Yeah. And so much of that was driven by the British East India company that was, um, in their export business eventually. Um, there was actually a committee that was eventually founded for translating of these works. And mm -hmm. so that's how Thor Thoreau came by many of them. Right. I'm not sure how the Upnikant, which was the German title of the Upanishads first, Correct. first came about, but probably through the, through the trade associations. I think so. Uh, they were first translated into Latin, which Schopenhauer read, and then I think into French, which I believe Thoreau read, um, some of it at least. Uh, and the English translations for these books were considerably later. Um, so, yeah. And I should say that, you know, there are 14 philosophers in my book. Thoreau was one of them, but I see these, these commonalities, you know, how Thoreau was a little, had a little bit of a, these other philosophers in him. He was a little bit like Socrates with his questioning of assumptions and his, his love of useful ignorance, as he called it, the society of the diffusion of useful uh, ignorance. Um, 
and he was a little bit stoic, I think, in his notion that we can control not events, but our reactions to them. Very stoic idea. He was a bit Epicurean, certainly in his emphasis on simple pleasures. So he was kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. Well, it sort of struck me that um, Schopenhauer and his curmudgeonliness, I think it was Nietzsche who commented, anybody who enjoyed playing the flute as much as Schopenhauer right. could could it, could it Could it really be miserable? And the same for, for Thoreau, who um, really was seen as um, an oddball. Uh, I think he was an introvert, it's fair to say, and introverts are... So often unfairly seen as being antisocial. They're not. They're just uncomfortable around ex people for extended periods of time. Um, Thoreau was clearly more comfortable in the, the natural world than the human world. Um, but he was a, a, another thing I learned is what a keen observer he was, though, of the human world from a distance. Uh, his descriptions of the post office and the people with giant ears um, that opened up. I forget. It was, he said it better than I did. So he sort of, I wish he had done more of that, actually, um, spent more time in town, and because he, he brought the same keen power of observation to the town that he did to the countryside. And from Thoreau, you learned sort of a quirky practice of his. Um, do you remember what that is? Could you... Yes. Well, in, in a broad sense, it was looking at the world at an angle, um, which I realized he was always doing. He was always... In reading his journals, I discovered this too. He would take a slightly different path, discover something new, tilt his head this way or that way, and even turn his head upside down, look between his legs at the inverted world, uh, which I attempted to do at Walden Pond, um, probably aroused some concern among my fellow pond goers, and, and the blood rushed to my head, and uh, I, I was going to pass out. It didn't work for me, which is the point. Don't be, don't, don't mimic Thoreau, imbibe him, which I think he would agree with. Find your own way. Exactly. It's, as Thoreau says. Mm -hmm. So I, you really begin this book with a provocative question, as much as um, looking at the question of Thoreau as um, pond scum or seer. And we say seer because um, the chapter in your book on Thoreau is to see like Thoreau. So that's one of your takeaways with, with him was that he was a, a seer, a seer. Um, but in the opening of your book, you actually addressed the question of, of suicide and, or put it another, to put it another way, whether the question in life is to be or not to be, as Hamlet asks, or you reformulated that question and you changed it to how to uh do i <laughs> well the big question is how to get out of bed in the morning oh yes of course well so it was camus actually who said um that the only serious philosophical question is whether to commit suicide or not and, and the rest are just trivial maybe true maybe not but to me it's the real question is how whether to get out of bed in the morning or not. Because once you decide, okay, you're not going to commit suicide, you still got to get out of the horizontal position. And that is the first chapter of the book, uh, which is how to get out of bed, like Marcus Aurelius, who was a Stoic philosopher, Roman emperor at the same time. And um, so this is, a, I've tried to write a practical book. Um, where philosophy is practical and getting out of bed is practical and being able to walk in a certain way is practical and being able to see like Thoreau is, is practical too. Um, in that, you know, in my previous book, the geography of genius, I wrote about, you know, what, what makes certain places and certain people more prone to genius. And a lot of it is not knowing, but seeing. You know, uh, during Einstein's time, there were physicists who knew a lot more physics than he did, but they didn't see the connections that he did. And that's why it dawned on me at a certain point in my research that that was, was Thoreau was about. He was the how to see person and that all his experiments in solitude and simplicity, such as they were, were really means to an end. And that end was better vision. Mm. And so this is a book on philosophers. Your previous works on the geography of genius and the geography of bliss, do you see the Socrates Express as sort of growing out of your earlier works? I mean, I'm trying to take chances and not to be 
a to fall into a rut of you know of the geography of blank 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 um but it's similar in that i am motivated by place right i didn't just write about thoreau and read about him i had to go to concord i had to go to walden pond i didn't just write about gandhi as i do in the book i had to go to india and walk in his footsteps and go to athens and walk in the footsteps of of socrates so I, in all my writing, I try to marry place and idea to find those connections. Um, because, you know, let's just talk about Thoreau. He, he uh, was a genius, certainly in his own right, I believe that, uh, but of a certain place and time, uh, and especially place. I mean, he loved Concord, as you know, and he, you know, friends tried to get him to go to Paris, and you've got to see Paris and London, you've got to travel, and he basically says, why? Why should I? You know, am I not made of Concord dirt and dust? You know, it's in my boots and the implications in my soul. So he was definitely shaped by the, the biggest little place of America. And, um, and so I am too. Um, I, I really believe that who we are affects where we are. There's a reason you're sitting in Concord and you're, you know, you could be anywhere really. You'd run the Thoreau Society from, from Alabama or Alaska for that matter. Great. And, and how the place shapes people, but the places also can be where your audience is or where sometimes you find yourself where, in a place where that's not your audience mm. and you're going outside your place in search of right. audience. Right. Um, which I think Thoreau had to do to some extent in order to become, to gain the fame that he did. Um, to, to some extent, Thoreau was rejected in Concord. Oh, he was definitely rejected. Um, but you can love a place that rejects you. <laughs> you know, you can have, you like, it, it's uh, kind of like marriage, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's, the idea is that in order to be really creative in a place, there has to be some friction between you and the place. Oh. So he loved Concord, but Concord didn't always love him back, which I think pushed him to explore his interior world, the exterior world. Um, yeah, and he did not. Um, the other sort of sad truth about a lot of these philosophers, nearly all of them I write about, is they did not enjoy fame, you know, in their lifetime. Um, and uh, there's a great line from, uh, I think it's one of his journals where he writes about having a stacks of his unsold books. I think it was his first book um, <laughs> stacked up in his cabin. And he says, I have a library of 800 books now. And it was all <laughs> copies of his. Right. Um, so, I just think, like, how did they keep going? You know, how did he face this rejection, not just from Concord, but from the publishing world, the literati world, and and keep going and stay true to his beliefs? Like, I I admire that. I, I think that took a lot of guts. Hmm. It was Horace, Gre Horace Greeley in New York that was it became his literary right. champion to some extent. Yes, he needed a champion, didn't he? As all, as all writers need a champion. Absolutely. So uh, today's, um, uh, today's talk is part of the right connection. So we have many people in our audience who are, who are writers, who are interested in writing, have writing projects. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, Eric, a, a little bit about um, how you um, came about the idea for this book. And particularly, I find it very interesting that you break down the parts of the book between um, the dawn, noon, and, and dusk, and then you put each of the philosophers under those, under those right. headings. Right. And Thoreau happens to fall under, under dawn. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your so, um, book? Writing a, a book on philosophy is, is daunting for the writer, and you don't want it to be daunting for the reader. So I made a concerted effort to write a different kind of philosophy book. Um, one that was practical and accessible and even fun and funny. Uh, and I realized I had to organize the material in a way that made it compelling. And so I started off actually with the notion that every chapter would be a how-to question. You don't get more practical than a how-to question. So how to get out of bed like Marcus Aurelius, uh, how to see like Thoreau, how to fight like Gandhi, how to be kind like Confucius, how to grow old like Simone de Beauvoir, how to die like Montaigne. And looking at the different uh, philosophers and how-to questions, I, I realized, or to be really fair about this, my editor, 
<laughs> and Simon and Schuster realized that there was an arc here of a day and of a life, and that there's certain how-to questions that are really central to us when we're younger, how to wonder, how to, you know, how to be curious, you know, and, and how to, you know, these, these things that really are germane to us in childhood. And then there are questions that are really important uh, in the prime of life, how to fight, how to be kind, um, how to appreciate small things. And then there are questions that really matter as well in the, the dusk of our life and you know, how, to, how to have no regrets, how to grow old and how to die. And so that became the structure of the book in those three parts with how-to chapters underneath one and a different philosopher sort of channeled through me or me through them to, to get at those questions and to find hopefully some satisfactory answers. And the, where um, philosophy be, can be very highly cerebral, you do, as you've said, try to make it practical. And part of the narrative thread throughout the book is you traveling by train to place. Yes, it's called the Socrates Express for a reason. Um, and I, I like trains. I'm not a total train nut, as some people are, who get excited about certain kinds of locomotives or track gauges and technical stuff like that. I like the experience of being on a train, always have. And I can think on a train. I cannot think on a bus. I cannot think on an airplane. I can think on a train. And so I got this idea to structure the book around these 14 journeys, a train journey, usually to the place where the philosopher lived and thought, um, Thoreau in Concord, uh, Schopenhauer in Frankfurt, Socrates in Athens, but not always. For the chapter in the Stoics, instead of going to Rome, uh, I went to Wyoming, to Stoic camp, um, mm. because it struck me as, you know, if this wisdom is truly portable, as I think all wisdom is, it should work in Wyoming as well as it does in Rome. Um, and the, each chapter begins with a, a train journey, a little vignette of me on a train, thinking, uh, cogitating, contemplating um, what I just experienced or what I'm about to experience. And um, it's the vehicle, so to speak, for that, that takes us through the book. Mm. You probably weren't planning that your book was going to be published during a pandemic. Oh, yeah, no, I was. I, I saw that coming. Oh, you, yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> so the the book in in many ways speaks well to, to at least to me during these times because um I've found I'm I'm just more introspective because of um isolating. It 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 works now, I have to say. Um in the first few weeks of the pandemic, myself and I think this is true for a lot of people, we were not reading and thinking. We were sort of deer in a headlight. Um and then people came out of that panicky sort of deer in the headlight mode and started watching Netflix. And then I think a couple of few, two or three months into things, people, especially like you and I, more introverts, started reading, rereading and thinking. And, and, and you're right. Um, you know, the, the epigraph of my book is, is from a French philosopher named Maurice Reisling, who said that sooner or later, life makes philosophers of us all. And I chose that a while ago. And then the pandemic happened. And I thought, well, welcome to sooner. Um, because in all seriousness, we are all philosophers now. I don't think there's a person out there, even those who, and I've met people like this, who say, oh, I never, I have no need for philosophy. I've never thought about anything. You know, I just go through my day. I guarantee you, everyone is thinking and rethinking, you know, not only which mask to buy, but <laughs> what am I doing with my life? They're having Thoreauvian uh, thoughts, you know, they want to know, am I living my life? Is it, am I living a life of quiet desperation? And if so, what am I going to do about it? And I think you're going to see a lot of um, people making some, not everyone, but some people making changes uh, in their lives. Yeah. And some of these philosophers, when you talk about stoicism, is a um, frame of mind that can help prepare you for, for rough times, right? That's what Stoicism is the philosophy for hard times. Um, it is, uh, in its essence, about coping with events outside of our control. The um, Stoic philosopher Epictetus wrote a little book called the Inchiridion, which means the handbook, thin little thing, like a pamphlet. And the first line says simply, some things are up to us and some things aren't up to us, which sounds incredibly obvious, except that we sort of walk sleepwalk through life thinking everything's up to us. So if we're not 
rich enough or successful enough or beautiful enough is because we're not trying hard enough or we haven't found the right dermatologist yet. And then, you know, it's, it falls on us and the Stoics say, no, it's not up to you. But what is up to you is your interior world. Mm. And in that sense, I think Thoreau was a Stoic and an Epicurean and a Socratic and everything else. Yeah. One thing I've found myself doing th during these times is I'm outdoors walking more. So, because just being isolated at home or I can come into my office, um, it's also so important to be outdoors every day, which um, I try to do during normal times, but just find myself um, more drawn to getting outside. And one of the philosophers in your book, I hadn't heard of her before, is um, Simone Weil. Vey, Simone Vey. Vey, Simone yeah. Vey. And she talks about, um, or you, your chapter title is, Pay Attention Like Simone Vey. Right. And similarities to, again, this overlap, uh, similarities to Thoreau. She was an early 20th century philosopher and theologian and fascinating, tragic person. Also died young, even younger than Thoreau at the age of 39. Um, but she had this very interesting notion about attention. She thought attention, as she defined it, was very different from concentration. She thought concentration was like narrowing your gaze, getting very tense, you know, furrowing your brow when you're concentrating and very muscular approach to whatever you're focusing on. She thought it was absurd. She thought attention, as she defined it, was more of a passive uh, orientation, passive yet alert, um, so that you're waiting for something to come to you and to see it. Um, Thoreau was very much like that. You know that he would spend hours just gazing at the pond and, um, you know, in terms of lessons that we could all learn, we could all be more like Simone Bay and like Thoreau. And, you know, one thing I've tried, certainly tried to incorporate these lessons into my daily life is to try to pause and just wait and mm -hmm. just wait to see what I see and not, not to jump to, con to conclu conclusions about what I'm seeing that, oh, that's, uh, that's a, ordinary bird. We see those all the time. I don't need to pay attention to that. Not that I'm a birder. Um, or, you know, oh, I, kn I know that. I, I've seen that. And, and we, we short circuit our powers of observation by jumping to conclusions about what we're seeing. And then once we've categorized something, I think this is a direct quote from Thoreau, when we categorize something and define it, we stop to see it. We stop seeing it. And I think that's very true. Mm. I wonder if it gets easier or we're just... Um more propelled to um, kind of a, take this, take on this attitude of paying attention because there's so much before us that's um, unknown. I mean, life is always unknown, but it feels like we're in a particular moment in history or time where um, it's very difficult to really see what's going to happen next. Well, that has been true for as long as there've been time and people. Um, and, um, <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't, I, I, it's easy to conclude we're in unprecedented times, but I started to compare, you know, Thoreau's time to ours, divided nation, new technologies coming online, um, anti-immigrant sentiment, um, disease rampaging, it was, you know, uh, tuberculosis in his day. Um, and I guess one of the points of my book is that we have been there before. Uh, we have philosophers, they all lived in tremendously uncertain times. In fact, the more uncertain, the more philosophical they were. Uh, and um, so I, I think that we can learn from them. And this notion that, okay, we have more gadgets to distract us. But Schopenhauer, writing in the 1850s and 60s, is warning people to put down a book sometimes and think of the answer on your own. Don't just look it up in a book. Today, he would say, don't Google the answer. Figure it out yourself. So I think the sort of fragmented attention that is our world today is really just an extension of what's been going on for centuries. Mm. Well, there does seem to be a heightened awareness of whether or not it's, um, I'm sure it's a constant, that it's always unknown, but there's a right. certain sense of heightened awareness collectively about just how... Uh, awareness, how yes. Opaque I the right. right, I would say. And um, a lot of philosophy is about, in my mind, about coping with the unknown mm -hmm. and making sense of the unknown. 
Um, and ultimately, the philosophers that I, were, I was drawn to land on a kind of radical acceptance. You know, I think Thoreau had that. Um, Nietzsche, with his idea of eternal recurrence, that the world repeats itself over and over again, and good and bad, uh, can, you, can you live with that? Can you accept that? Um, or, um, or Camus with his myth of Sisyphus. How can we imagine Sisyphus happy? Pushing this boulder up the hill, having it come down over and over again. Can you imagine Sisyphus happy? And the only way to do that, Camus concludes, is by kind of throwing yourself into this pointless task, you know? And <laughs> much like writing that on some days, yeah. <laughs> Doing it happily. Yeah. Did you find in any of these uh, philosophers that you looked at um, one that struck you as more optimistic overall than the rest? Well, that's a really good question. Optimistic. I mean, uh, Simone de Beauvoir was, 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 was quite optimistic um, in that as an existentialist, she be did believe that we, we make create meaning in our lives. It doesn't, isn't handed to us. And she continued to do that um, late into life. Um, Montaigne also, I was quite fond of, came around to a certain, a certain optimism. Um, I'd like to think that the philosophers were all sort of beyond the pessimism, optimism dichotomy, because extreme optimism like extreme pessimism is kind of a, there's an arrogance to it that you know what the future holds. You know, to be a real pessimist, you're like, things are really going to be bad because I know. Well, that's kind of arrogant. And to be an extreme optimist and say things are going to be better because I know, that's kind of arrogant too. And the kind of intellectual humility that Socrates demands and I think Thoreau advocated means that you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and that, that eliminates both pessimism and optimism from your vocabulary, if you know what I mean. Hmm. Well, then th that sort of brings me around to... Um, when you and I spoke um, the other day, we had a, mm -hmm. a Zoom meeting together. Um, we discovered that we both have a, a mutual interest in um, Mahat, Mahat, Mahatma Gandhi. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, Gandhi and his, um, you say that he teaches us how to fight. He does. And what I do think. What do you mean by that? I, I was being purposely provocative because first of all, it's true. But second of all, people think of uh, Gandhi as this meek, passive, thin saint of a man. And he wasn't. He was a fighter. And he, in his writings, he writes about the need for courage and manliness. He uses that term a lot too. Um, and he was confrontational. He got into good trouble, as John Lewis said. And John Lewis got that notion of good trouble, I'm sure, from Gandhi um, and made it his own. Um, but he thought, if you see injustice in the world, you must do something about it, but you must do it nonviolently. But that doesn't mean not confrontationally. And so he really was a fighter. And he believed in the necessity of fighting. He believed in such a thing as constructive conflict. At the end of the battle, um, both sides can be better than they were in the beginning. And, and he believed, and this is important, of course, in doing this all nonviolently. Um, so he absolutely was a fighter. Um, he just taught us a new way to fight. It's incredibly valuable, I think, and incredibly relevant right to this day. Mm. And didn't you, t you retell a story in your book about when he was a barrister in, in South Africa and his experience riding the train? That's a, a famous story. If you've seen the, the movie, David Attenborough, I think it was, Gandhi. Um, um, he's on, he's, gone to South Africa. He's a young lawyer. This is a, about 1904, I think. Um, he's suit and tie. He's not the Gandhi from the pictures that you might imagine. And he's only been there like a day or two. And they send him on a business trip and he buys a, a, a first, they give him a first class ticket and he's going to ride first class because he's working for a fancy law firm. And uh, he gets to this one stop called Meritsburg uh, in the Tal province. And uh, Conductor comes through and he says, no, no coloreds, that's what uh, South Asians were called in, in South Africa, allowed in this section. He's like, but I got a first, I have a first class ticket. And the conductor said, well, don't get the policeman to escort you off. And the policeman did that. And Gandhi's 
unceremoniously thrown off the train with his luggage and he sits there all night on the platform freezing and thinking, do I let this slide off of me or do I fight this? And do I go back to India and fight this? And that was the moment, at least in the mythology, and I think it's true, when he made that decision to be a fighter and to fight the injustice that he experienced and that he knew others were experiencing. Wow, what a moment. And it was just, um, of course, it's a moment in the movie Gandhi, but it also strikes me as such a pivotal moment in Gandhi's life. And right around this time, too, is when he began, um, I think it was in 1906, he published Thoreau's Civil Disobedience in two parts in a, in a newspaper where he was encouraging his, um, his fan club or his followers mm -hmm. to, um, to read Civil Disobedience. Yeah, and he, he read Thoreau, he wrote Tolstoy. It's really interesting, like the, the sort of back and forth between India and Concord, that here you have um, Thoreau, uh, before Gandhi was, was born, uh, sitting in his uh, cabin of Walden Pond, reading the Bhagavad Gita and imbibing these ideas, which maybe on some level influenced his ideas in civil disobedience. He exports that essentially, or Gandhi imports it to South Africa and to India, uh, and then adds his own ideas to you know how civil disobedience should be conducted. Gives it a new name, Satyagraha, meaning literally soul force, and and advances the idea. You know he was standing on the shoulders of giants already, but he advances the idea. And then Americans like Martin Luther King Jr., who in 1959 traveled to India, met with Gandhians, learned about his ideas, and brings it back to America. So it's just been going back and forth, you know, between India and the U.S. for centuries now. Yeah. Well, Thoreauians have long been interested in the question of how much did Thoreau influence um, Gandhi. And um, one, one of our founding members, Walter Harding, who is also a oh, yeah. biographer of Thoreau, right, right, actually, and we have a copy of the letter in the Thoreau Society Collections, he wrote to Albert Einstein and asked, do you read Thoreau? And what do you think of Thoreau's connection with Gandhi? And Einstein replied, well, I think that Gandhi would have been Gandhi regardless of Thoreau. And I haven't read very much Thoreau, but you know, thank you for writing. Uh, yeah, I mean, Einstein was quite fond of Gandhi um, and maybe knew less about Thoreau. Um, Gandhi would not have been Gandhi without everything that went into making him Gandhi, including studying the Jain religion, reading Tolstoy. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say whether any one ingredient made Thoreau Thoreau or Gandhi Gandhi. It's, it's I love hard. it. So you yeah. may disagree with Einstein. I'm going to disagree with Einstein. You can do that. <laughs> so now um, I have, we'll take some questions from our Okay, great. So one person writes, I really liked your Geography of Genius book, Eric, and wonder if you could see applying it to Concord in Emerson Thoreau times, and how? Absolutely. Um, it, it was a little genius cluster, uh, Concord was. Um, it was Henry uh, James who called it the biggest little place in America, and at first, I'm like, but what does he mean by that? And then you start to look at what was going on there, um, starting with the Revolutionary War, and then really with the Transcendentalists. And that was philosophy, and that was writing, right? So Alcott and Hawthorne. And then you just had this ferment going on. And it, in a pretty small town, and it's remarkable how much came out of Concord, but in that period. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I think Concord, like a lot of these places of genius, has, has moved on and probably not producing that level of genius. Um, but one thing I learned in the geography of genius is these genius clusters, as they call them, are pretty fragile. Um, and they last a few decades, maybe half a century, and that's about it. So Concord had its day. I'm not saying couldn't have it again, but it, it definitely was a little micro cluster of genius um, for a few decades, at least. Yeah, so that's something that I think your books are speaking to the, a, a broader question about culture in some ways. Right. And, and my argument in Geography of Genius is that genius is, is born out of a culture, that geniuses are not 
born from birth. It's not just hard work. It's the soil that they need to grow in. And some soil is just more conducive to growing geniuses, if you will. And Concord absolutely was for a while. Do you think there are ways that we can consciously work to create the conditions? The, the, there's no formula. If there was a formula and I knew it, I wouldn't be talking to you now because I'd be on my yacht in the South Pacific. Um, if because I knew the formula. So no, there's no formula, but there are ingredients um, that help make a place of genius without getting into it too much depth. You know, one of them is being in a cross currents of ideas um, and actually having a, a fairly high number of immigrants because immigrants bring new ideas. Um, and there were, there were certainly Irish immigrants in Concord during Thoreau's time. Um, and a certain amount of creative friction. Um, people, again, of, from different walks of life in different uh, idea sets coming into contact with each other so that you picture a container of molecules. And if you have a large container with just a few molecules, they're not really going to bump into each other, but you pack in a lot of molecules into a smaller container and they're bouncing off each other and forming new combinations. And I think that's what happens in these denser, then more densely populated places. Mm. So in, in writing the book, were there, were there any surprises for you? Oh were yeah. There... <laughs> Every, there were there anything that was not a surprise? Um, I was, uh, I was surprised first of all, how some of these philosophers were actually good writers. I thought they were all bad. Thoreau, of course, a beautiful writer. Also Schopenhauer and Nietzsche could actually write. I was surprised at how heroic they were um, in that they, they kind of, it wasn't, it was a little bit easier to be a philosopher back in the day, but not a lot easier. You still, like Schopenhauer, his father really wanted him to go into the family business. And he was like, no, I want to be a philosopher. And he stuck to his guns. And like, as I said before, they would, they would like Thoreau publish books that aren't read by anyone, panned by the critics, right? As Walden was by many critics. And yet you keep going because they believed in the power of philosophy and the power of their ideas. Um, and also I was surprised at how human uh, they were and that they were imperfect. Um, you know, brings us right back to pond scum. They had pond scummy tendencies. They, um, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would expose his buttocks to strangers in public. This caused problems for him. You know, mm -hmm. Schopenhauer talked to his poodle. Simone de Beauvoir drank too much. I mean, they, they all had issues, and yet that didn't stop them from this love of wisdom, which is what, you know, what, that's what philosophy means. It means literally the love of wisdom. Um, so another person has written in and says, Eric, I enjoyed your geography of bliss and would be interested in how you would connect Henry's ideas of simplicity to happiness. Hmm. This is a good question. Um, I, I, I think in this way, Thoreau was Epicurean in the original sense of the word. Uh, so Epicurus, like Thoreau, believed that um, we pay a price for our stuff. And that price is not merely the purchase price. There is a mental price in owning something, buying it. You then, you know, or even going out and having a fancy meal, which apparently people used to do. Uh, and, you know, you would uh, have a delicious lobster thermidor. And then uh, Epicurus and Thoreau would say, well, you're now, you're now addicted to that, that, that hit of lobster thermidor. So you have to keep working at that job that you hate. And that boss who's a jerk, you've got to be nice to him. Um, and you need to all of a sudden uh, do all these things to maintain your fix of this pleasure. And Thoreau, um, rightly identified our unhappiness as being caused by too much stuff and not a lot not a lack of stuff but a lack of tranquility um and you know i think he was a little he wasn't uh, people think he was a luddite he really wasn't and he had mixed feelings about the railroad for instance um mm. ultimately pretty skeptical of it um but um, you know, there's, I came across one description he had of telegraph wires is sounding like a harp playing. And, and um, I think if he were to come back today, he would look at all our technology and iPhones and he, he might own an iPhone, but you know, an older model 
and he would leave it behind when he went for his four hour walks. And um, I, I think he would, um, he would find our time exactly like his time, only more so. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson would, was very fond of referring to Thoreau as a stoic. And we often mm -hmm. think of stoicism and Epicureanism as um, opposite poles, but in fact, they're um, closer aligned. They're in closer alignment than maybe we. Yeah, maybe they, we they, 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 um, they're still at each other online to this day. The Stoic groups and the Epicurean groups, um, they look. They're different, but there's a commonality, um, and I think Thoreau hap happily existed in that in between state, sort of borrowing from each. And that's, you know, one of the points of my book is that philosophy, unlike religion, you can, you can dabble, you can, you can have a little Ikea philosophy where some assemblies required, you know, and take a little bit from the Epicureans, take a little bit from the Stoics, take a, a lot from Socrates, take a lot from Thoreau. Um, and there's, you know, that becomes your personal philosophy, you know, and you don't have to invent something, but you do have to approach these with a fresh eye. Okay, so as we, as we um, get closer to our hour and to begin to um, wrap up our conversation, uh, do you have any, uh, any takeaways for the audience, what you hope um, the book might, might achieve with the reader? Yeah, so I think it's, it's fair to say that most people out there have read Thoreau, know something about Thoreau, um, I would say, if you're a Thoreauvian, buy my book, read my book, not only because Thoreau's there, but because there are 13 other people, thank you, like 13 other philosophers in there, and some of which you may know about, but I guarantee there are a few that you don't know a lot about, or maybe like Sei Shonigan, the Japanese writer, you don't know anything about, um, and approach them with the fresh eye and that you first brought to Thoreau when you first read him. And um, I hope you'll be surprised and I hope you will find it fun. And I think that fun and philosophy can coexist um, <laughs> and humor and philosophy can coexist. It doesn't need to be this serious dour subject. Um, Thoreau had a lightness to his writing and to his approach to life and, and I, I hope you, that comes across in my pages. I hope you enjoy it. Well, I certainly enjoyed your book. And again, uh, this can be purchased at the shop at Walden Pond. And we've provide, provided links on our website. And I certainly highly recommend it. I was able to read through most of it um, before today's talk. And uh, it's a, both a, a lighthearted read and, and it's humor, but it's also has depth and weight. And I think um, you can find nuggets of wisdom in each of the chapters. Um, and the chapter titles themselves are intriguing and you can sort of pick, pick your way through the book that way. Thoreau as seer. Nietzsche, how to live without regrets. Um, Marcus Aurelius, my favorite, how to get out of bed in the morning, like Marcus Aurelius. So, um, thank you so much for joining our community today, Eric. It was a, a pleasure and an honor. It's my pleasure. And uh, we um, look forward to, I look forward to finishing the book. And um, I think everyone should go for a nice long Thoreauvian walk right now. If it's sunny where you are, get outside. Perfect advice. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we can um, conclude again. Brought to you today by The Right Connection, The Thoreau Society, and The Thoreau Forum. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eric. Bye, everyone. <laughs>